week number four. This is our fourth time of doing Eat, Drink, and Be Catholic at Home, and it's a delight to have all of you here. Uh, for those of you who have never been to Eat, Drink, and Be Catholic via at-home version or the one in the upper room at Moe's, uh, let me just start by welcoming you, especially welcoming you to, uh, for taking the time to join us and give you a brief uh, kind of understanding of what we are about here. Uh, Eat, Drink, and Be Catholic's mission is to offer women and men of all ages a casual and friendly chance to explore their Catholic faith together. Uh, we hope that we can provide a space um, for some intellectual, some relational, and certainly some spiritual growth. And the hope is at the end of each evening, the individuals that come here not only know more, but are also inspired and empower, empowered to live out what our faith celebrates and teaches. We've been doing this uh, for quite some time, since 2008. So for, the, for those of you who are here for the first time, where have you been? is the question. Uh, no, uh, we, we've talked a lot about Chad Nye is my, my co-sponsor of this, Chad Grizzle, and, 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 and uh, we're, we're, we're delighted to do this, but one of the things that we may have changed as we think about the mission that we have is that we would maybe change the title to Eat, Drink, and Be Catholic with a small c, meaning Catholic being universal, because really all are welcome. Uh, Christ is the host tonight, really, but but uh, Catholic meaning universal, that there's no sort of, you have to be Catholic to come here. So that's not, that's not the message. The message is that we're, we're an open and inclusive group, and we're delighted that you're here. Chad? Thanks, Sean. Uh, to echo what Sean was saying, uh, again, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, while you are muted on this call, please feel free to use the chat function if you have questions, uh, if you're having issues, I can't promise we're going to keep up with everything, but we'll try our best uh, to, to continue to be as interactive as we can with this large of a group. Um, also, we are going to try to follow up. Um, our conversation is being recorded tonight, and we will upload it to our Family of Four Parishes YouTube channel. Uh, so if this ends up being a fruitful conversation for you, please share it with your network of, of people so that we can continue to widen the circles of influence and our circles of connection. Uh, let's begin, though, with prayer. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1956, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech called, The Birth of a New Age. In this speech, King says, The present tension represents the necessary pains that accompany the birth of anything new. And so, Jesus, you tell us, of the labor pains that are to come as we move towards the reign of God. Lord, help us to face the pain of facing our past and present so that we can cooperate in building your kingdom of peace, justice, and mercy. Dr. King goes on to say, but there comes a time when people grow tired, when the throbbing desires of freedom begin to break forth. Lord, you know our desire for real freedom. It's a fire burning in your sacred heart. Empower us with your Holy Spirit so that we rise from our tiredness to stand for a community of love and welcome for all. Finally, King declares, we live in one world geographically. We face the great problem of making it one spiritually. Through our scientific means, we have made of the world a neighborhood and now the challenge confronts us through our moral and spiritual means to make it a brotherhood. Heavenly Father, help us to see all of our sisters and brothers, not simply those who share our faith, our race, our nationality, or our political convictions. Give us the courage to see your children as you see us. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to share my screen here for a second. And by way of introduction, uh, some of you know that I have a 12-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, and at the end of this very unusual school year, my son was asked to create a presentation using principles of Catholic social teaching. Uh, and specifically, he was asked to use them to apply them to issues of race, uh, and some of the events that we've heard in the news over the last couple months around George Floyd's death, uh, the removal of Confederate statues. And so my sixth grader chose three principles that he thought were key to bringing our faith to these emotionally charged topics. And I just want to share these with you 
uh, as we introduce our, our speakers tonight. He started with number one, the dignity of the human person. Yes, all lives matter because all lives have been created in the image and likeness of God. Human life has an immeasurable worth that must be protected. The second he chose was solidarity. As members of the body of Christ, we're all connected. When one part of the body is hurting, we're all hurting. We are our brother's and sister's keeper. And third, he chose a preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. We offer special care and attention to those who are marginalized, victimized, and vulnerable. Saying Black Lives Matter is not to contradict the fact that all lives matter. Rather, it's an assertion that Black lives have not been honored and protected as they should be. Jesus and the Father reveals to, that he reveals to us stand with our Black sisters and brothers, just as they stood with widows and orphans, Samaritans and lepers. And so it is in this spirit of Jesus' life and teachings, along with our great tradition of Catholic social teaching, that we invite you into tonight's conversation with our friend, Michael Adams. Thanks, Chad. I, I just, uh, I get the, the chance to introduce our speaker and I thought about um, the best way to do that. Uh, and one of the words that kept popping into my mind was the word integrity. We all know the definition of the word integrity is the quality of being honest, having moral, uh, strong moral principles. You know, the, the, he is known to be a person of integrity. That's certainly true of our, of our speaker tonight. But the other definition of integrity is the state of being whole and undivided. And I thought that really fits tonight with what we're going to, to speak to Michael about. And it's with gratitude, great gratitude, that I get a chance to introduce a dear friend who I've known and admired for many years. Um, in 2018, Michael was honored by the Archdiocese of Milwaukee with the Vatican II Award for Service and Society. He's the Director of Employment Development and Milwaukee Jobs Work. Uh, whose mission is to provide a comprehensive and effective pathway to self-sufficiency for motivated individuals in Milwaukee. So please help me join, uh, join and help me welcome Michael Adams. He and Michael, is here. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to unmute yourself, Michael. Got it. Hi, everyone. Hey. We'll get so, through this. Yes, it's fun. This is the fun part. So, yeah. Michael, um, in, in the introduction, you wanted to maybe give a little bit more about your role uh, in Milwaukee Jobs Work as, as to get us started. Yeah, thank you, um, Sean I, and Chad, both for for having uh, allowing um, me to join you guys for the second time. I, I've I've always enjoyed these uh, conversations, um, and. Uh, Part of, well, what we are doing, what we are doing at Milwaukee Jobs Work um, is we're providing um, really support to individuals living in our communities, um, regardless of their race, regardless of where they come from. But the, the, the common theme is uh, where people are really um, struggling, uh, actually living in poverty. These aren't what we would call poor people. These are people living in poverty. Sometimes they're your neighbors, they're folks that we sit with um, and sit next to at, at mass. Uh, and we support those individuals uh, in two ways. We work with them on helping um, them develop their skill sets to go uh, into the workforce. Um, we support them in the workforce even when they're in work. So it's not just about getting them a job, but it's about helping them get a, get a job, um, grow in that job, uh, it's a stability job and help them then go into um, an advanced job. The other side of that business or of our business is um, helping um, small businesses um, that are in the city, particularly um, uh, minority owned businesses, grow and, and get capacity as a business. And the reason why we want to do that is help them grow and build capacity um, is to hire. Um, so what we do is we have, on one hand, the workforce side, and we have the small business side. As the small business owners grow and build capacity to hire folks, they hire the folks from our programming. Um, none of this costs any money. We are, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we have been supported by the entire Milwaukee philanthropic community, and I just want to say that's a huge deal for us because uh, even in these times, 
they have all reached out out of what we call grant cycle and said, what can we do to keep supporting you? So um, our whole mission is just to, is to, is to serve and help individuals um, become and, uh, and attain the potential that they want. As long as they're motivated, we stick with them. Excellent. Thank you for doing that, Michael. It gives us some background. And you did have the pleasure, and we had the pleasure of having you speak uh, on site at Moe's a couple years ago. Right. And it's great mm -hmm. to have you back. Um, you know, tonight we, are, we really want to make this a dialogue and to better understand sort of your experiences and your reflections on kind of what's happening now, kind of with the backdrop of Dr. King's speech from 63, 64 years ago now. Yes, um, sure. Yeah, and, uh, as, and, and in preparation for this, I think we both felt like all of both the three of us felt that there was so much in that speech that really resonates very well today. But I wanted to start a little bit way back when, not that far back, you're not that old, but uh, can you kind of share your experiences of, you know, growing up as a black Catholic man in Milwaukee and, and, and even some of the, the military experience of being a military kid growing up in Alaska? I was wondering if you yeah. might get us started there. Yeah, so so I, I, I'm very proud of the fact, you know, I don't, I don't think I've, I've only met one other person who's ever grew up in, in Alaska before uh, that happened to be black, but uh, it didn't matter. I'm just meeting somebody from Alaska. I get all excited, but um, we, uh, my father uh, was in the military uh, and my mom and he, uh, he was assigned to um, Anchorage, um, uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base to be specific. And um, that's where I grew up. I had, I grew up probably, I was probably 10 years old when we left, um, but uh, there was a lot for an eight, nine, and 10 year old to, to, to witness uh, in Anchorage. Um, but we had, it was the best life. It was, uh, we, lived, we lived on base most of the time, um, but it was the best life. We, we socialized with everyone. Um, now, mind you, this is in the 60s, the late 60s, and, and um, a time where we're pretty much like we are today, a time of turmoil, a time of, of, of things happening, and um, what ended up happening is um, we lived a life with our neighbors and we're, we, were, we were always, we had the feeling of equality. Um, we understood where we were as a people, though. My, my parents were from the South and they absolutely made us understand um, really um, what was, really was going on in the world at the time. We're very, very exposed. And the contrast between that Anchorage life and coming to Milwaukee uh, was, was pretty stark uh, it, it, because uh, coming to Milwaukee, um, everyone was nice and everyone was smiling and everything, but you just had a feeling there's something else going on there. And so um, in Alaska, we knew where we stood. Um, uh, again, in the 60s, my oldest brother was the king of prom in the 60s. You know he didn't go to prom with a, with a black woman, but in the 60s, that's a big deal. And um, we were all like, whoa, you know, but um, we came to Wisconsin or what we call the lower 48 and, and life just really changed. Um, just a really an antidote. Um, you could do anything in, in Alaska. You could lay, lay your bike anywhere, do anything. And I'll never forget the first thing my father did was take me to Sears and Roebuck, uh, bought me a bicycle, had the guy put it together for me. I followed my dad home and I didn't even want to put it in the car. I'm going to ride it all the way home. And um, first day I'm, I met some kids and I said, I'm going to go show every my, my new friends, my new bike. And I uh, parked my bike outside went in the house to tell my friends to come on out and see it and came back out and my bike was gone. Just gone. This was in and Milwaukee? This, this is in Milwaukee. This is now in the lower 48. And, and um, I was mortified. What, who was still my bike? My father sat me down. That moment sat me down and explained to me where we were. And he says, we're not in Alaska anymore. And he says, things are going to be a little different. And uh, he began to have a t the talk, which we'll talk about a little bit about later, but we began to have the talk and understand that, you know, um, we're gonna have to behave a little different. And so that was my awakening, but my father quickly put me in the car and went to Sears and Roebuck and bought me another bike the same day. And he said, it wasn't your fault, you didn't know. But he says, now you know, don't lose your next bike. But um, yeah, that, that, that was a, an, 
an eye opener for me in terms of what to expect down here. And it's just kind of been that way all ever since. Yeah. And then, and then as a, as a person who is a black Catholic man in Milwaukee, your parents were Catholic in, I mean, both were Catholic, obviously in Alaska too, or is that a, was that? So, so one of the things, you know, I, as, as an adult, I, I, um, my father passed, um, uh, in, um, in, Oh five and um but all along I would always ask my parents why are we Catholic? Because I've been like, I'm a, a cradle I'm what we we call a cradle Catholic. Um mm-hmm. I've been a Catholic my entire life. Uh and I because I knew my folks came from the South and I knew my grandmother, I knew that she wasn't Catholic, and I just wanted to know how did we become Catholic? And my father and mother both told me, they said, because we knew you we would get you the best education that way. That's how folks saw Catholicism back then, was that's a great education, they're gonna take care of you and all that stuff. And so as I'm growing up, um, um, Catholic schools my entire life, never been to a public school, I missed the hot lunch thing. Um, And then uh, I I think the other issues for us really uh, growing up um, in terms of how my my parents um, explained this to me was, um, they again. They felt the education was going to happen for us, and um, I just fell in love with the whole notion of Jesus, as my mother explained it. Because um, she was not Catholic to begin with, and they converted. and And for her to then become to explain this, the word as we call it in the house. Um, I, I kind of took that up on my own to, to to do more and become an altar boy and to join the church choir and to be very active um, in my church. Uh, I go all the way back to Holy Angels. Those of you that might remember Holy Angels and then got shut down. And but so so that's when we moved here. I I was was a member of Holy Angels Catholic Church. Um, loved it. Just I I, I uh, also grew up at Credo Catholic too, and I've heard about these hot lunches, but I've also heard it's not you didn't miss much, so it wasn't all that. Yeah, you know, but still, you know, just one of those. <laughs> right. I see some right. head shaking. Right. Yeah. But it still shapes you today. I mean, I know you through. Um, I met you at Mo's, but I've known you more through All Saints than I than right. and gotten to know you more through All Saints. But it's still a big part of your life today. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, you know, when you talk about what do you do in your spare time. I, I think we have to continue continue to be a part of our of of what should, in my opinion, and I'm not I'm not judging or saying anything, but for me, it's the spirituality piece, you know, in terms of how, how do we uh, continue to have a place where folks can find the word, where folks can find what Jesus walked this earth to do. How can we? Where can we do that? And and I wanted to be a part of that development. So I so as part of all Saints, uh, and prior to that, that was St. Agnes. Uh, mm-hmm. It closed its doors and, um, and uh, opened, reopened up, and, and I was on parish council. I've been on parish council more years than most of you, like a lot of you, I'm sure, have been on parish council, so you know how it goes. Uh, but it, it was never a job. It was a labor of love, you know, to be a part of the community, to be a part of ha- creating a place where people can come in the name of love and 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 meet and commune together and so even to this day you know um i'm very active in our church uh we we have a new pastor um uh, father arthur and he's a very dynamic guy uh but if we don't do it it's just like everything else is going on today if we don't do it then who and and so it's just not even a job. It's just it's just what we do. We get up, we go to work, we get up on Saturday, we go do whatever we need to do for church or whatever. But um, I, I couldn't see living without that being part of <clears throat> of what I do. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of things, but I just I I believe that we have to be active in our in our church. Yeah. That's fantastic. You mentioned your father passed in 2005 and your, your mom is, is she still alive or? Yeah, mom yeah. is alive. And, and, um, you know, um, has always been the, the central part of all of her five kids. I have, uh, four, uh, four brothers and one sister. I'm the middle kid. 
and um, always been a part of our life as far as our, our spiritual development. And um, my mom had a major stroke this year, uh, just before COVID, and uh, it was debilitating to um, a point where she can't move or anything. And it's interesting you ask because I want to say, you know, when we talk about faith, um, what I really rest, in, rest on is, is all my life, she's always said, have a great relationship with God and always talk to him and listen to him as well. And so now with her in her state where she's, she can't communicate verbally, um, she can't move, I pray every day for my mom. And I ask all of you to pray for her because what I pray for is while she's in what I call her quiet time, her, and that's what I call it, she's in her quiet time, I hope she's resting on all those words that she imparted on us as kids. I hope that she knows that she's not alone and that God is with her. I hope that she knows she's not been forsaken um, because, you know, that's the ultimate test to be a person who all your life you've, you fed all the people that come to your house, you fed them with the word. And then all of a sudden, um, as you get into that later stages of life, you can't say anything. Now you have to rely on your faith and you have to understand and pray in your heart that, and just have those conversations with God. And that's what I hope, I hope and pray that's what she's doing. Yeah, it, we, we, that's beautiful, by the way. And, and Chad and I had the good fortune of having uh, a prepared conversation uh, and questions that we want to discuss and kind of the theme to tonight's dialogue. Um, and it's just, it struck me that your stories, the way that you talk about your parents is just beautiful. And it reminds me that the best Catholics are converts. So um, they, they fit that mold very well. What are your parents' names? Uh, my mother's name is Lucinda and my father is Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Lucinda. Okay. Well, and, I will, and, we'll keep Lucinda in our prayers. Thank for you. Sure. Thank you. Um, as it relates to your, your, your faith, I have a little shift directions here. And one of the things that I, uh, it's not my comment, but it was made recently that I thought made sense was that racism in our country does not seem to take a day off. And kind of your sharing of faith means that our, the way we combat that is faith doesn't take a day off either. We don't just go to church on Sunday and then the rest of it figures itself out. But you, you talked about um, the talk. And uh, I shared a, an anecdotally that my 23-year-old daughter in college, so a couple of years ago, her uh, her uh, very good friend, roommate, uh, 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 a woman of color from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, talked about what the talk was. And Mackenzie said, well, my dad had the talk with me when I was four, uh, 12, which she meant <laughs> the Burton Beats. That's not the same talk. What is the no. talk? Well, the talk, you know, and I think uh, Judge Mosley, Derek Mosley, those of you know him, he, 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 I forget what, how he phrases it, but mm -hmm. I do phrase it as just the talk. And most, most, most folks know when you talk about the talk, you're talking about having that talk with your child around the, a, a, an age where you know that they're going to be out of your, your view for a long time. Uh, that talk is really about how you behave, um, not to the neighbors, but how do you interact with the police? That's the talk. Mm -hmm. um, that may sound, wow, you have to have that talk. Yeah, you do. You have to tell your child, that, particularly when they get their driver's license and they're on their own, you got to tell them. Um, both hands on the wheel and not for safety, but I'm talking about when you get pulled over, not if you get pulled over, but when you get pulled over, both hands on the wheel. That talk is to make sure that you understand that this person, um, and we have to talk about the realities of what is happening in our nation. Um, whether people agree with why it happened or not, um, we see some, some travesties happening and you don't want to ever see your child in that position. Um, knowing that I have been in that position and I know how I felt and I knew and thought I was this person that could be the control anything and and you can't when that talk is all about making sure that you survive that exchange that moment that that 15 20 half an hour moment you we want you to survive it so we have to tell you how to how to do that yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned Judge Mosley because he he talked about interactions with the police or and he even talked about a social media post that was asking what age were were you when when you had a gun pulled on you have have you actually had had can you talk about the negative experiences that you've had with the with police in your lifetime? So for for me, you know, and and I um I've never had uh, I've never had a police officer point a gun at me, um, mm -hmm. but interesting thing. Um, 
I was uh, on the east side uh, coming from a meeting um, one Friday night and cutting across Brady. If you guys know Bra uh, Brady Street, it's that short strip going across. And uh, halfway through, there's a usually a motorcycle guy parked there. And um, he, 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 there were several cars went by him, but I knew, and I was on the phone with my wife, I knew he was going to, I just knew he was going to pull me over. I, 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 I drive a fairly nice vehicle. All my lights are working, everything. But I just had a feeling. I just knew because he looked at me. We made eye contact, and I just knew it. And he pulled one car over, second car over, kept going, got behind me, pulled me over, still on Brady Street. And I just said, hey, officer, how you doing? Um, Why would you pull me over? And, and, and again, I, I, I'm not trying to be a smart mouth. I'm not trying to, I just, why would you pull me over? He said, because I can. And when he said I can, I got scared. I, 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 I really felt that. So when we talk about the gun thing, um, it wasn't a gun. But mm -hmm. when someone's standing over you, usually, you know, you're in the car, you're seated, they're standing there. They have that over you. And, and all you see is that leather, that gun, all that stuff, and, and, and that fear. So I, 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 I have had a, a weapon pulled on me before and I know the I know what that means and and that feeling that I I felt when that has happened I felt when he said because I can mm -hmm. um, because I can do anything to you and that's how it starts and then I started imagining myself it's a Friday night I was on my way to get the pizza from a meeting you know I, it's gonna be a great evening my wife and I'm gonna enjoy a Friday night pizza and he didn't make it home he got he got choked or he got he got shot or whatever and that's 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 real that's yeah. so real that i pick my way home depending on 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 what day it is what time it is is it dark i i have to pick my route home i love to drive through the suburbs i think it's beautiful to get and and get home through you know the beauty of milwaukee's a beautiful town mm -hmm. but some days i gotta i have to just take that highway and get off at the closest exit and try to make it home that way because I don't feel like sitting on the curb or getting pulled over for a half hour to run my license to not give me a ticket to just say, okay, have a good evening. I'm not going to have a good evening. Right. It's just not going to happen. So the threat doesn't necessarily have to involve a gun. And as we know from the George Floyd situation that there were no guns pulled. So, I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah. A absolutely. The threats, the threats are real. Um, but you know, um, I, I will also preface, though, that I have been pulled over um, and I have been treated kindly. But mm -hmm. it's just that it's that time where when, when someone says to you and, and, and everybody listening, think about it. You know, someone says to you, I'm doing this to you because I can. That's huge. And, and, and particularly when you when you recognize them as an authority figure. See, I don't discount the authority of the police and I don't. And I don't disrespect them. And I don't believe that we should take a stance that cancels them out of society in the sense of what we need, but we have to change the mindset of policing. We have to change how people become. And we also have to realize the police are human beings just like us, they're fallible. And, but we also need to make sure that mental health is, a, is, is always uh, addressed in that sense, because just like us, they're human and the stress that they have every day can lead to a breakdown uh, and taking shortcuts and treating people in a different way um, because of it. Now, that's one reason why. And, and, and but another reason can be just the overt racism that exists in, in, in that type of system. Yeah, it's funny. Thank you for kind of explaining that because it, it's 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 it dawns on me that that is a, a very real way, just having to travel a different direction and different yeah. routes is, is striking. And, and you mentioned it, and I, I just ask, you know, Dr. King refers to it in a speech that the uh, overt versus covert racism and that he says, the South and its blaring and conspicuous, conspicuous forms compared to the North and its hidden and subtle form. And you grew up as uh, part of your life in Alaska and then down here in the lower 48. How does that ring true for you here in Milwaukee in terms of overt versus covert uh, racism? Well, when, when you when you look at a situation, when you look at um, creating uh, divisiveness and disguising it um, in a way that 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 just cancels everything else out for individuals that are um, 
um, trying their best to just be a part of our society. Um, I think how it, how it rings is um, it's, it's you, you, you come at everything in a, with a different lens. You come at things um, with a lens of suspect or uh, is this person really real? And I think it cancels out your opportunity, our opportunity to engage in an honest and, and, and meaningful way where you find that there's a person that you believe uh, is not being honest with you or, uh, and, 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 and it's hard to really put it in the best words because it's more of a situation where you feel um, um, the genuineness of, of an individual. Um, that, that's really how I would, I would kind of leave that. Okay. Well, you know, your dad and mom grew up in the South. So you, you mentioned your dad sharing with you after you got your bike stolen and he kind of explained a little bit of the rules that uh, you weren't aware of. They grew up yeah. at a time where maybe the rules were, no, they don't, didn't agree with them and they weren't right. At least they knew what the rules were, the, kind of how the game was played. Is that right. an example of, you know, how, how it fits in, in the framework of where, where, it, where we are here in Milwaukee and in your experience? Yeah, I, I think it does, Sean. I, I think that a lot of a lot of um, what Dad was was trying to get across to us was really, um, you know, and, and you got to put yourself back some years where um, we were just brought up to respect the police. And, and matter of fact, if you got in trouble, um, you should seek out the police. You know, I'm lost. You know, or or whatever. And even my daughter, I would, I would, when she was a child, I would tell her, if you get lost, find a policeman. He'll help you get home. That type of thing. But you know, when you, when you have this talk, and 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 Pop was telling us a little bit about policing, but really more um, about just the difference between the South and the, or the difference between the North and the lower 48, um, it involved a lot of, a lot more activity, not just police. It, it involved understanding the people that you're going to hang around. Who are you going to befriend? Who are you going to let into your life? Um, but I think that when we talk about this type of difference between the South or the, 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 for Alaska, for example, and, and the lower 48, in terms of how we are treated as individuals, um, I knew exactly, and my father says, we always knew where we stood in the South. We always knew where we stood in Alaska. Um, we thought we stood a certain way here, and come to find out, you don't. And sometimes it's that person that's your neighbor that you thought was a really cool guy, and, you know, um, then all of a sudden, you know, as I think about one instance as, as a 13 year old <clears throat> um, trying to play with someone uh, next door and them saying, we, we, you, we can't play with you. And um, I said, why not? And I don't, I think everybody listening can understand the rest of that story, but that was, you know, wow, really? Yeah. Um, on our own as kids, we're fine. Something happens when we become adults sometimes that just changes the whole uh, dynamic, right? Yeah. Ken, you're yeah. next. I wanted to, Michael, I wanted to go back. Um, you sent us uh, Martin Luther King's speech uh, from 1956, uh, The Birth of a New Age. And I'd really highly recommend that people read it. And I just wanted to, to start with a quote. Um, King says, social institutions have a great last minute breathing power. The vanguards and the guardians of the status quo are always on hand with their obstacles in an attempt to keep the old order alive. Uh, and I, I was struck by that, just how completely timely it is. Again, 1956 speaks directly to me to 2020. Um, and, and, and the last time Sean and I had Eat, Drink, and Be Catholic, we, we really centered around Brian Massengill's article um, where he looks at the story of Amy Cooper in Central Park. Right. Uh, where, for, for those of you who haven't heard the story, uh, a white woman felt threatened in Central Park, calls the police uh, because he had asked her to follow the rules of leashing her dog. Uh, and you said, when, when Sean and I were talking to you, you said, I wish I had video when it happened to me. Uh, can, can you give some examples where you've ex of experiences you wish you'd have filmed? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so my history prior to 
MJW, we call it Milwaukee Jobs Work, uh, long before uh, was was in corporate America. So my background is, um, you know, a, I'm in corporate America. I'm a logistics um, distribution in a leadership role for some major companies. And and, and my wife and I uh, again met here in Milwaukee, um, got married, and quickly knew we needed to get up, get out of town. So we went to Chicago, far enough to you got a call to come visit, but close, you know, close enough that you can get there quickly. Uh, but living in Chicago, again, uh, in that comparative of uh, overt, you know, Chicago is a little bit, um, it's a different town. Uh, I, I think um, for me, my experience was my potential for um, excelling uh, was far greater in Chicago than it, it was in Milwaukee. And uh, I appreciate that, but there was a, a particular instance, there's instances where um, uh, I, I won't get to the company or particulars, I will tell you that someone may have said something uh, as an employee, uh, they, they worked for me, and um, we have to, we've all had to have a talk with our, with our boss, you know, hey, look, I just want to put it back on track and we keep going, no big deal. And um, Interesting enough, um, I would get these all of a sudden just this 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 r raging tears, and I'm looking around like, what? Why are you crying? And then I get the screaming thing, you know. And so you, you stand back and you're you're shocked. And and so I I saw that 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 video uh, in the Rampart in uh, in uh, New York, and I and I said, wow. I, I've been there before where you don't, you didn't do anything. And all of a sudden, you know, everyone's saying, what are you doing to her? You know, and so it's me. Um, but but the, the more interesting piece of that isn't about me. It's about the fact that after that, I probably had three, four friends call me and saying, man, I just feel so vindicated. I knew that's how it happened. And that whole piece, you know, we, we say these words some folks aren't comfortable with, but how um, I heard some commentary that the young lady probably is, is, is a good person. And I bet she probably is a good person. But when you see how it was just a really um, a matter of fact to reach down and just push the privilege button, expecting a certain kind of outcome that typically does happen that didn't happen this time. And I think the video, I think that we're in that age now where it's really hard to not have something on film anymore. And um, I think the fact that people are really starting to wake up and, and, and not ask the question, well, he must have done something. No, he didn't. He was breathing. He must have done something. No, he didn't. He was just there. And so uh, that, that theme probably throughout most of my career, I've either seen it or experienced it myself, where um, individuals um, would, would just rely on the fact of, of it, it, it was the color of their skin. It was the privilege, that, that privilege of the assumption will always be, you must have done something, Michael. No one just starts crying for any reason, for no reason. And so, um, uh, I'm not going to say that there are times where a manager or individual isn't wrong, but you know, I know that there are a lot of times that I can tell you that it's just it's a it's, it seems like there's this invisible button that just gets pressed and everything just shifts and next thing you know it's it's a bad deal. Yeah, when when we were talking about it you said it wasn't malicious, it right. was automatic. And, and was that really that, that really hit me that it it, it wasn't some I, okay, here's how I'm going to do it. It, it. it just flowed naturally out of the culture that we've all been swimming in. I, I agree. I definitely do. Um, in, in terms of uh, what's been going on, uh, obviously a, a lot of people I think have, have been awakened to some of this because of the George Floyd case. Um, can you share a little about Joella Acevedo, um, his story and your relationship with the family? Here in Milwaukee. Yeah, so so in the background, I don't know if most of you can see it or not. My big head, unfortunately, is <laughs> is covering it up. But I just wanted you to see. The, if you all can see that, and I'm gonna move now. Um, but 
Joel Acevedo um, was a young man, uh, the son of Jose Acevedo, a friend of mine, and also uh, happens to work with Milwaukee Jobs Work. And Joel, um, uh, if you all don't know, um, um, was killed by an off-duty police officer, Milwaukee police officer, uh, back in March. And uh, he, that, that, that off-duty officer used um, uh, what is uh, a hold, a chokehold, and Joel um, never uh, gained consciousness after that. And um, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a tragedy um, that black and brown people and people in general are being subjected to that type of restraint that we know is deadly. Um, I don't think Sean and um, Chad, you and I have even talked about this, but I, I don't remember, maybe we did, but um, I also, in my spare time, my father always wanted all his boys to, to, to know how to take care of themselves. So we all were, um, as kids, forced, but I, I wasn't forced. I loved it. Um, uh, we were all encouraged to take martial arts, and I took it to the level of becoming an instructor. Uh, I'm a black belt in karate, and I, I, I know that choco. I know it, and I know it only takes four seconds four to five seconds and that's it. And, and so um, Joel was at the peak of his life. I mean, he, he was a kid. I mean, he was 25 years old, uh, just starting. Um, he had a job at NML as a, as a um, uh, security guard, um, had just recently left that job to do something else. And um, always wanted to be, and he want, and the ironic thing is he wanted to be a police officer. You know, that's what he wanted to be as a police officer. And um, his life was snuffed out by someone. Uh, we don't know all the details. And I think it is prudent to, to wait and let those details come out. But what we do know is we know that that, that officer admitted that he did choke Joel. He had him in a chokehold. Um, I know that family. And um, they are God-loving um, individuals. Uh, it's the most horrific time. Um, that you could imagine losing a child that at all, but in that way. And um, I just, my heart goes out for him. So the picture in the background, again, is that first rally, if you all remember, the very first rally it was held at the officer's house. It was peaceful. Um, and, and that's Jose and his wife, Mari, just hugging each other. And the thing I love about that picture is, is I've continually talked to him every day, and I'll actually have a call with him after this call. Uh, to see how his day was going, how his day went. Um, but um, when we look at George Floyd and we look at all of the, the other countless um, uh, killing murders, um, this is right here at home. This strikes, this, this, this touches a chord in me that I cannot even begin to express how I feel. Um, when, when you feel the anguish of a dad, you know, and I'm a father with a 25 year old daughter. And I just, I, my heart goes out to him just like I know all of yours probably does as well. Um, but you know, I will say this, someone said to me, well, um, what do you think he did? And I said, it doesn't matter. His, he, he, he died and whatever he did wasn't, no, we have to stay focused on the situation. Um, the violence part, I want to just touch touch on that a little bit, Chad and Sean, if I could, real quick, Please. because this 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 marching, this protesting, um, it's not like anything. Our country's always been a country of protests. We've always been a country that been that, that that's what we love about our democracy is the the right to get out and protest what is right and what is wrong. And so we should be doing that, and but we should be doing it with peace. And that's what we were doing that day. I was there. Um, and, and, and it was a beautiful time to, to watch people come together. Um, socially distancing well, wasn't the best thing we were doing, <laughs> but um, you have to weigh these things out. And, but it, it's just a terrible thing that, that, to witness in our own city what's going on. But, but, but I would ask everyone to stay focused on the issue. The issue uh, was, is, is life. And, and let's stay focused on that and, and not get wrapped up in those other folks that are out there tearing the city apart. They'll get dealt with, but Joel deserves his justice. And the only way he's gonna get his justice is if 
we stay focused on what happened in the case, not the other stuff that's just deplorable. I get it. But let's not ever cheat Joel from the justice that he, he deserves to get. Yeah. Um, you, you sort of started talking about this, but in, in terms of marches and, and protests here in Milwaukee, um, what have your impressions been? And, and what is some of the fruit that you hope comes out of them? I mean, I think one of the questions I hear from people is, well, what do they want? And, and yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You, you talked a little bit, I mean, first of all, justice yeah. for, for real people. I mean, I, I think as you were speaking, I was thinking, I think one of the dangers of some of these cases is especially when they're not in our city, they become cases, not people. Right. Um, but right. what would what, what are some, what's some of the fruit you'd like to see coming out of it, either here locally or nationally, uh, as these protests or marches, whatever we want to call them, continue? Well, well it, I think it's already kind of started. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, when you look at and think about all of what's been happening, um, one thing I, I, I will say, and again, it, and it'll go back to the top of the call where, we, where I was, I mentioned that, you know, I have had situations where I've had interactions with police who have treated me with a lot of respect and dignity and, and moved on and I moved on, everything was good. But, you know, one of the things I have noticed was um, two things come to mind. Um, we have a neighbor and, and, and we share a fence. And my neighbor that we share a fence with happens to be white and, and, and again, um, probably hasn't gone too much further east or uh, south of his fence, you know. I mean, he stayed in this area because we, we, we live out, um, far out in, um, on Mill Road. And, um, but he, would, he, was, he cared enough to ask me, like, what's, what's, what's really going on? Here's a neighbor who, you know, we're cordial. He barbecues, I barbecue. He cuts his grass, I cut my grass. We're very competitive that way. But we really didn't talk. But our first real conversation was around this stuff. And, he's, and, and he, he just asked me for permission to, um, he said, would you excuse my ignorance? Because there's just so much I want to ask you, but, and I don't know. And I'm like, that's fine. It, it's absolutely fine. And so I think one of the fruits is coming is I'm, I'm having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals. Um, I'm having conversations with people of which whom even some of my very own biases, you know, uh, come to come to play and, and I learn something. So one of the fruits I think is that, um, and, and I think we have to do this, which is I think um, God wants us to be quiet and listen to each other. And I think what I'm what I'm getting the vibe is is that a lot of folks are are wanting to know more. Um, the confusion on on a lot of faces I see, and I and I understand it is, but they can't. TV can't be wrong. The news can't be wrong. Or, um, he, but what did he do? And and the confusion I think is people are starting to really understand that there is a divide, a clear divide. And, 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 and I think that's, that's a fruit to, to recognize a problem. Now, I'm also now seeing a lot more care in terms of let's get a resolution to this problem because it's not a black problem. It, it's a us problem. And, and, and until we all understand that and start having a conversation together with each other and not be afraid to say, I don't, I don't have any, any black people that I know. And, and I have always had these questions because if you rely on just the news or the newspaper, you're going to get, you're going to get information, but it's not going to be as factual as if you just ask the question. So the fruits I see is really is conversations have really gotten deeper. Um, people uh, really want to know. And, and the other thing I see in this, in this protesting is I see a lot of diversity in the protesting. Uh, I will tell you, go back a year, two years, um, particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I think you always saw a lot of Black folks. Now we're seeing it's very diverse. We're seeing it's all across our country and it's spreading around the world. And so um, where there is tragedy with Joel, where there's tragedy with George, um, you know, God has that way of providing that seed 
to replant um, our conversation and the narrative is going to be different. And I'm very hopeful and faithful that one day we all will, as Dr. King said, we all will. And it, but we have to do it together. You know, if you think your silence is okay, it's not. Silence is violence. As you've seen a sign, it's, it's, it's just as bad. Don't. You've yeah. got to find a way to get involved in what the, what's happening right now in our world. Yeah. You know, you, you've, um, in your last time that you, we were together, and you alluded to this already a few times, uh, but in your role at your job as the director, you talked a long time about how every week you get in conversations with people. How, how are you doing? How are things going? That it, there is this connectedness to being in conversation. Right. And I find it to be so powerful and so beautiful that that's really a, a theme that runs through you. First of all, I've known you a long time. I know you're a fun person to talk to. I enjoy our conversations. But, you know, that's, a, that's an intentional effort on your part at Milwaukee Job Works to, 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 to do that. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, Sean. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and, and thank you. For, you actually held that in. You know, that's something we talked about a while ago. And so, but, you know, at, at MJW, uh, um, we are committed to reaching out to all of our people that come through. And we call those folks when they graduate our two-week workshop, we call them members. We, we, we want everyone to feel like they belong to something. And so you are a member of Milwaukee Jobs Work. And because you're a member, that comes with the privileges of, and, and the supports of our team. And so one of the things I've asked my staff to do, and this is part of our process for our pathway, is to make sure that we're reaching out to individuals and making sure they're okay. During this time of unrest and pandemic, we, we, we have um, individuals out there working, a lot of folks working, and um, they're, 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 some of them are, well, they're all, they're all were essential. Um, I think essential was a play on words, to be frank and honest. I, some of those, I don't know why it's essential to be doing that, but okay, they were essential. But the point was, there's a great deal of trauma and stress with, with, with going out there. There's a great deal of trauma and stress trying to find a bus. Uh, we had a young lady, she, she had to be at work, I believe at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, which means she has to leave at the first run, maybe 4.30, 5 o'clock when the buses start running. She had to wait for three buses before she could get on her bus because they were only taking 10 people at a time. Well, you know, um, now she's late for work. We have to intercede because an employer just says, um, yeah, you were late. Well, yeah, well, she, first of all, she got up and she's never been late ever, ever before. And now we've got a situation where she's upset because She's being told she was late. And you have to understand, some people hold on to things, perfect attendance or whatever. And we had, we, we're advocates. We go into uh, an employer partner of ours and, and, and we're gonna be their voice of reasoning saying, wait a minute, five minutes, pandemic, buses, 10 people. I mean, help me understand that. And um, sometimes you find that people just are in the automatic mode and they don't understand uh, what they the, what they did, the influence of that, and um, but that turned out in a good way. Um, but that's what we do on a regular basis. We're always talking to our people, making sure they're okay. We hold town halls just like this, um, and we want our members to dial in and just ask, "How are you dealing with this pandemic? How are you dealing with this with this um, this this whole marching and protesting piece? Are you staying safe?" Are you wearing PP at work? We want to make sure our members and my staff uh, are safe. Uh, we want to make sure that they have all the supports that they need. Uh, and we do that on a regular basis for anyone who becomes a member of Milwaukee Jobs Work. So that's from dealing with the employment supports, the barrier supports, whether it's trauma, mental health, housing, whatever it is. And again, we're a nonprofit. And always looking for volunteers who really want to come in and talk to us. So that's a little. It, it seems like in your conversations, you pro provide a, a great deal of hope. And I, I go back to the speech uh, from Dr. King in 64. And one of the quotes he made was, as we move in this transition from the old age into the new, we will have to rise up and protest. We will have to boycott at times. But let us always remember that boycotts are not ends within themselves. A boycott right. is just a means to an end. Boycott is merely a means to say, I don't like it. 
It's merely a means to awaken a sense of shame with the oppressor, but the end is always reconciliation. The end is the creation of a beloved community. So when you think about that hopeful end to that, you know, that message that Dr. King gave, where, where are you finding hope right now? I'm finding hope in the people that are willing to have conversations and like this. Um, I'm finding hope when I'm, when I'm in the supermarket and I hear someone having a conversation that doesn't sound as educated and I want to maybe stick my nosy nose in it. And that person doesn't push me away, but says, let's talk more, you know? Um, and, and I, I'm finding hope. In, in, in watching um, the, the young folks and the older folks getting together, marching peacefully um, and hearing and listening to each other. Uh, I'm finding hope in our church, uh, in our Catholic church. I saw a, a letter that was put out, um, um, Black Catholic Concerns Office, and I, and I don't know if you've seen that letter yet, but I encourage everyone to, um, whether it, uh, your parish, where your parish is, find that letter, I'll send it to you if you need it. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm finding hope when I'm seeing us as a church people um, talking to a, the community, like we talked about before, I think we're not doing justice if we're just Catholics in a circle. I think we have to work out of that, um, always be authentically Catholic, always um, be who we are, but we have to be inviting. And, in, and the hope I see, I have is, and I see it, is we are inviting people into um, um, our sphere of, of where we are and what we do and how we are reaching out um, to the community to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to be heard, to be seen, uh, and to be loved. And so my hope is, is, is continually, but it's small chunks and I take them every day. I take it. That's how it's going to be. Um, most folks want just, you know, a quick fix, you know, open the bottle, pour it in, we're good. Um, it's, it's not going to be like that. It's not like that. And it's going to be us having these one-on-one -on -one conversations and getting back to the basics. And, you know, that it's, it's so easy to get overwhelmed because, as you said, there's so many different issues. Um, yeah. And I think that can be the enemy of hope is, is just allowing ourselves to get overwhelmed. Um, is there one issue, I mean, we, we could talk about housing, jobs obviously is a big part of, of what you're doing work-wise. This issue of policing has come up, mass incarceration, education, mm -hmm. transportation you brought up, healthcare. Um, where, where do we start? Uh, is there one area that you think is, is more ripe or is more foundational right now uh, to encourage people to, if, if they want to dip their toe in the water, where do, where do you start? So the, the, way, the way I see that, um, Chad, is I think that uh, you, you can't just, you just can't start at one place. It, this is a very complex issue. So where I would start is um, I encourage everyone when people say, what can I do? And, and, and I, I was on a call earlier today and I had a businessman and he's like, well, you know, I, I hire people already and I hire people from the city. And I said, that's easy. You needed people from the city, but what, what can you do that's hard to do? What, 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 what can we all do? Well, I will tell you that most of us have someone we know or someone we know of, a person of influence. And can you imagine that all the folks that are on this call right now, if we um, called a person of influence that we knew or wrote a letter, really more importantly, uh, letters are way more important than the, than a call, but if we, if we sent an email or a letter, um, um, that's the beginning. Reaching out to a person of influence that we can change the system that is. Um, I think one of the things that people get caught up in is, what do I do? I don't, have, I don't know what to do. Um, do something. Make a phone call, stand beside, um, there are folks who can't leave the house and who don't want to leave the house currently at, in, during this pandemic. And what can you do? And when you don't know what to do and all else fails, um, there's a lady who I respect a lot, and I'm going to throw her name out there. Her name is Rosemary Murphy. Um, she works at All Saints Catholic Church, and she runs the food pantry, and she runs the food, the, the meal program. 
um, Rosemary and I talk a lot. And one of the things she said to me was when things get really dark and, and there's no, you don't know what else to do, she says, pray. And that's, that's what I say. And, and, and it, it's, it's a small word, but it's, it's, it's so powerful that we all have to pray. And we have to pray that God continues to bless us and watch over us and watch the ones that we love. And, and he, he's going to make this right. But we have to be also actionable people. Everybody, there's something you can do. If you don't uh, know what to do, Sean will give you my email and I'll help you out with that. Yeah, it's interesting. You, uh, parts of the speech that you shared it, and, and some of your reflections too that, that we also um, got a chance to, to look at with you is this notion of like, you know, dependence versus interdependence. And, and, and I think there's a connect, great connectedness to the fact that while we pray, you know, all day, all damn day, right? Pray as much mm -hmm. as we can, trust mm -hmm. in the hope and the providence of God. There's that independence that says, you know, you know, we're not working for God, we're working with God. And so maybe right. part of working with God is actually, is actually doing the work along with praying, right? So, so, when you, so this group tonight, I mean, as an example, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple ways to do that and to engage in conversations. Um, how, how do you, how do we make the transition, right? We, we, we can, we want to pray, we will pray, we, but we want to make the transition to action. And, and, and some of those things that you've seen have, have been helpful are, are what? So I think some of the things that are helpful in terms of really uh, finite actionable items are, are um, you know, and, and sometimes some of the stuff I'm going to say might, might ruffle some people's feathers because, you know, we want to always be careful and be politically correct and so forth. But um, that's part of the problem. And so one of the very first things we have to do is we have to stop trying to be politi politically correct. And, and we have to stop worrying about hurting someone's feelings. If you're coming from a place of love um, and your intention is to be helpful, that's the very first thing. It's just really recognizing that, that don't be afraid to have a conversation with of someone you don't know. Go somewhere and sit. When you sit this time, sit next to someone who you don't know. And frankly, it doesn't have to be a black person. It just has to be someone else who you can engage and have a conversation and, 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 and kind of weigh in on that conversation. And, I, and these are bold things, but I can tell you, um, it, it's what has to happen. I think we so long have sat in our comfortability and we have to get out of that comfort zone and, and really put ourselves out there. That's what he wants us to do is, 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 is get out there and just be, be uncomfortable for a minute. But after a while, you'll, you'll understand that it's, it's, it's okay. I survived it. I got through it. That, this, uh, that Chad, comfort zone. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, no, I was just saying that comfort zone. One of the things that we've been talking about the last several weeks, and, and I think in the midst of a pandemic, this is one of the things that's awkward is we, we've been talking about getting out of the upper room and the sense of yeah. Pentecost of being sent out. And for many of us, we, we feel like we're, we've been forced into a room <laughs> because of the pandemic. Um, but and it really goes back to what you said at the beginning of our faith isn't just simply something we do on Sunday. It's, it's something we live out. Um, what, what are some simple ways we can leave the upper room, uh, leave the, the comfortable places where we can talk about these things and, and go out and do what the disciples did, which is engage people who are different, engage people who don't see things the same way we do. Yeah. So um, I, I think, I think some of those ways that we, 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 definitely need to get out of that comfort zone is um, first of all, understanding where we are uh, ourselves personally. Um, do we have an understanding of the conversation? Are we, are we attuned or in tune to what is really going on out here today? And I mean, th these current times, are we, are we attuned to that? And I think that what we have to do is absolutely make sure that we know, we know ourselves enough to say and, and putting ourselves in check first and say hey um admitting where you are and admitting if you are if you're living a life of privilege there's nothing wrong with it in the sense of of having things and having stuff but you know 
you have to be aware that sometimes when we reach back and 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 lean on that privilege um when you're leaning on something it's putting pressure on something right is it putting pressure on another person or a a, a neighborhood or or um some sort of initiative that perhaps you inadvertently didn't realize what you're doing understand your place and know what know how you're impacting um society you, you should know, everyone should understand their role in this society. We aren't just here to kind of live through life and then die. I mean, we're here to be impactful. We're here to leave a mark. What mark are you leaving? Um, when you talk about what other things, specifics, I think that's gonna be in everyone's own mind and heart as far as specifics. You know what you're capable of doing. I certainly wouldn't ask folks to get out there and start protesting. Um, or, or, or do something that's going to bring them physical harm. Um, but, but there are things, and you only, you know. A lot of times what that is, though, is what you're afraid of. And so come to grips with what you're afraid of and know that you're not alone. And the way we can come to grips with what we're afraid of and know that we're not alone, again, is reaching out. Um, I tell folks in our workshops, we call them CRWs, Career Readiness Workshops. And these are... Um, a whole mixture of, of, of folks, men, women, average age is about 36, 37 years old. My, 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 my business partner, Bill Krugler, would kill me because he's the statistician of our organization. I am not. I'm the warm and fuzzy guy. But I can tell you that all these folks that are part of this CRW, this Career Readiness Workshop, one of the things um, we, we encourage everybody to do is to understand who you are and know that you are loved and know that you do matter and when we talk about you matter we talk about love and so a lot of times when we're having these crws um my turn to come on to present um for the most part most of these folks have never met me um they've met staff and so they're, they're, um, they're always surprised because in the very first meeting on the very first day within the very first minutes of the very first hour, I am telling everyone in that room, honestly, and I mean this, and this is for all of you on, I love you all. And they look at me like, how could you love me? You don't even know me. And I said, but you don't know me. So you don't understand. That's what I was put on this, on this earth to do is to love you. So when you say, what can we do? It comes in this package of love. How do you all individually disperse your love? And think about how you do that. Is, is it to a certain person, to a certain kind of people? Or is it genuinely, openly, and out there? And I don't mean be a flower child and go out and hug folks you don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, sometimes we look at the same people all the time. Instead of saying, let me open my eyes just a little bit wider and see other people. See folks that normally would walk by you and say, he didn't see me. See that person, the person that says, I don't believe that I'm relevant. See that person and let them know how relevant they are. That's the beginning of it for me. Yeah, and that's, that's really, that's the powerful part. I mean, I think we forget about uh, love as the emotion versus love as the great and powerful love of God. Right. And, you know, and right. It, it reminds me of that, you know, you talk about, um, you, you mentioned Dr. King and silence is violence, but in a way, 64 years ago, um, uh, you know, he talked about this danger of an optimism, which he said is like a substance that we can sit down and do nothing because, you know, it's the new age is inevitable and everything's going to work out. You know, because if, you know, God loves us and we love, right. well, we, we can sit down and wait for the rolling in or the wheels of, of inevitability, as he says, as Dr. King says, but we don't, and if we don't do anything, it, you know, we, we cannot afford to be complacent. So moving from the upper room means moving from our complacency. So he suggests that we cannot sit idly by and wait for the coming of the inevitable. He would urge us not to take the attitude for, it might be true that this new age is inevitable, but we can speed it up the coming of this new age and the idea for me is that that chad talked about earlier is that notion of like how powerful love is you know that right. that, that if, if anything it's just not just like you as you have suggested it's a conversation because you know truthfully you know if i was to be if i was to, to say this i think for most people in this in this call when we care about the people that we're connected with 
suddenly they mean more to us than the color of their skin or their background or where they work. They are important and vital friends to us. And, and it's taking that, that next step, I think, is so, so critical. Do you, do you yeah. think that's what your experience has been when you have a connection with someone in love or in, in some way connects you to them and care, that you care for them deeper than you would had you not known them? Absolutely. And I think, I think when you can make that connection mutually, um, there lies the answer, right? And so I think that um, when, when I connect with an individual who I, 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 who I don't know, and we start having this conversation, um, and we start talking, you know, and again, you know, um, we, we, we're all Catholic on this line. We understand we, we aren't the holier than thou when we, we're not out there pe passing out pamphlets and things. I mean, but, but we are out there having a conversation that's around that, that notion of love, not even the notion, but that actuality of love. And in doing so, while that's, that's going on, Sean, I can tell you that it's transformative um, in, in, in the highest regard. It really is transformative. And it happens at the blink of an eye and you walk away, you go into it with, with, with this whole feeling of apprehension, perhaps, not knowing how that person, but, but for me, and I, I would ask all of you to try this, is, is that, and, I, and I, I really do, is, is I meet strangers all the time. And, and, and like I said, I, I, I'm gonna let you know where I'm coming from and, and, and then my arms are open. And if you want to come in, that's fine. If you want to walk away, that's fine. But I, I uh, was chosen to walk this earth and speak that word and, and, and love folks. And um, it, it's, it's just, it's the only way. And, and it's been, it's so simple, you know, when we talk about it, people say, well, what's the real secret? The secret is love, but it's, it's not like falling in love. It's like true essence of what he's been, his word is all about. That's all it is. When you open it up to me, I always envision it as when I open up the Bible, it's like this light comes out and it's just nothing but love. If, if the words could transform to some sort of energy, that's what it would be to me. That's my kind of way of seeing it. So beautiful. I really, uh, beautiful I, and and your anecdotes and the and and the, ch the challenge that you've given us and mostly by the way that you live your life um uh, thank you it's not a wagging your finger it's more of a not a proselytizing but like hey this has worked for me and here's my experience is good bad but always hopeful i mean you yep. you made it intentional as you and i talked with chad we the three of us talked about how we wanted to make this hopeful it is a challenging time and it has been for a long time but you know the time is not to give up hope and that's what you exude for us thank you for that and thank you i was going to end with a prayer but i wanted to if there's any final thought or any anything that you you know would like to share with us before we do that um i i think one of the things uh i i just want to say is i i was just taking a quick peek at some of the some of the um the uh chats because i always want to make sure that folks are heard or or their their, their points are are, are taken and I just want to say thank you for the well wishes and thank you for the comments to everyone that's um, in this in this on this call um, I will challenge everyone and give everyone some homework and I think that homework's going to be uh, for everyone to um, really really soul search and understand and define write it out what 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 you're going to do write it out how you're going to do it and I, and I really mean this, and, and, and if you only knew me, you'd know. If you're struggling with that, find me, you'll be able to find me, um, and um, we can have a conversation about it. Because if we don't start having a conversation, um, we won't get anywhere. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that want to have that conversation and don't know how to. And um, just be gentle with me and we'll be okay. Yeah, well, Thank you, Michael, uh, as always. And uh, oh, uh, can I, one of the real quick thing. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I just, um, I also have to say this, and she's nowhere in earshot, but I'm going to say that um, I am absolutely thankful to have a wife that I've known most of my life uh, once we got here, met her, and um, been married 33 years and um, absolutely supportive in the work um, that we are doing. 
And I think it's very important to have someone like that in your life to help you when this, when you're doing this type of work, because, um, <laughs> because um, it's hard work, it's a hard lift. And, and so one of the things we have to make sure is that uh, if, if we ever feel ourselves um, alone and don't have anyone, um, please, just like I told you at the top of the call, remember my mother and remember that even in her quiet space, if we have faith, we have God. And so always know that you're not alone. And in these times, I know it's been hard. It's been, we, some, of, some of us have never left the house, uh, but just know you're not alone and know that you are loved. And I was laughing, I wanna say this last thing, I was laughing because Bill Krugler must be on the call because he texted me just now to say, it's 39, it's your average age is 39. So he's, <laughs> he's, that, that's, our, that's my guy, that's exactly what he would do. So a, thank you all. Yeah, um, thank you, Michael. This is, this is really hopeful and wonderful and all, as always. I, I would just uh, like to end tonight on a closing prayer, prayer reflection that I wrote in uh, anticipation of this evening. Um, the special moment first uh, saying good and gracious God thank you for Michael Adams thank you for his, the gift that he is to to not just us tonight but to the city of Milwaukee and all the people that he touches we thank you for Roosevelt Adams his great father who taught many great lessons of love and especially mindful of Lucinda Adams who is in the moment of quiet space so we all pray for her and, and that, that she that her words that she gave so freely to to the people that she loves, that she embodies that in her own belief and faith as she moves into this new space for her. Um, there are people, God, in, in our lives that are both living and dead, whom we love dearly, but who may have had things about them that were ugly, like bigotry and racism. Even in our own hearts, we harbor some biases as well, as, uh, as well and that we're probably very ashamed of. And perhaps that's why labels like racist or white privilege can be very difficult to accept. Our faith in you, however, reminds us that we are all sinful human beings. Often we are beautiful disasters, and yet you love us anyway. In these challenging times when we witness the ugliness and the hatred, the racial indignities and the violent acts against one another, it's hard to imagine that your dream that all may be one will ever be realized. We know that without kinship of community, accompaniment and walking with one another, things are unlikely to change. Without a desire to seek a relationship, a conversation, to get to know our brothers and sisters, then it becomes easier for us to just use labels to describe others and keep our distance emotionally and physically. We know in ourselves and in the ones that, that we love that we are more than our sinful nature. Jesus knew it too, for the outcasts were his friends. His followers and the people he chose were not chosen because they were brilliant. Jesus knew then and knows now that we are much more than the ugly parts of our humanity. And within the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, we are humbly returned to ourselves and seen for who we really are as beloved children of you, our creator God. Our prayer tonight is that you will help us extend that love to all for if we can easily love those in our own circle of family or friends, will you help us to expand that circle? On the heels of recently celebrating Father's Day, my prayer tonight is that we may reflect your love in the world so that we may all widen our hearts to love your very own children in the same way as we love our very own children. And when your children cry out to the world, who do you love the most? As our brother's keeper and as our sister's keeper, may we respond to the suffering world. We love the one who needs us the most. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks again, Michael. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, guys. God bless. God bless.